Good evening ladies and gentlemen, how are we getting on? Welcome to a brand new Fallout 76 video. So today we are jumping back into the public test server to take a look at the next round of new stuff coming in the summer update this year, including a couple of new public events and some really brilliant UI changes. So let's jump into this. Okay, so yeah, the PTS reopened last week, it was a Friday night, and uh, it's got a couple of bits and pieces on it that are quite cool and that Bethesda have talked about. So I'll link down to the PTS blog post that's on Bethesda's website below. But the general gist of it is it's focused on the two new public events. However, there's a bunch of other cool stuff going on in this test as well that they haven't included in there, but it's worth taking a little look at. So uh, first up, as you can see, we've got a new title screen looking at one of the new locations or two of the new locations that are featured in this new update or will be when it arrives in June. Got some cool new music as well, which you should be able to hear in the background. I'm going to run that all the way through rather than doing my usual music thing and uh, rather than having all the, the noisy gunfire. So uh, yeah, enjoy. Quite like it. It's pretty cool. And uh, let's have a look at a couple of new events. So. As you guys are probably well aware, Bethesda have introduced a bunch of new public events over the last year or so. We've had about six, I believe, in the last year. And uh, they are adding two more with this update due in June. That is uh, Safe and Sound and Beasts of Burden. So we've had a little talk about these in previous videos and stuff, but uh, we're actually getting a look at these now. First up, Safe and Sound. We'll go through this fairly swiftly. This one is taking place at the Middle Mountain Cabins. That's just sort of up into the Savage Divide from the White Spring. It is pretty cool. The location was okay before, but basically not used for anything. So they've completely overhauled it, and it's now got a whole load of barricades around it, stuff like that, and there's walkways across the roofs between the buildings. There's a few characters here that you can trade with. They seem quite cool. And basically, the gist of this event is it's a defense-type event. So we've got a number of these in the game already. It's not particularly new, per se, but it's fine. So basically, you trigger the um, doohickey in the middle, and waves of enemies will attack, and you take them out, defend the thing, and once you've defeated all the waves, then you get a bunch of rewards. So, fairly standard, it's alright, seems quite fun. There are a whole load of new legendary rewards, legendary items coming from this couple of events. Some of them are sort of reskins of existing ones, but they're relatively rare, so it's quite cool. We've got some nice skins on there, there's some nice tweaks and stuff, and they look like they're going to be quite good fun. There's also some entirely new weapons in there as well, one of which I got on uh, my first run through Safe and Sound, which looked quite interesting. That was the uh, branding iron, so yeah, quite cool. So yeah, basically, nice bit of new content, not the most massive exciting thing ever, but um, they look like decent events. So the second of the two events is called Beasts of Burden, it takes place down in the Cranberry Glade, which is a pretty cool location that has been somewhat underused, given this spot an overhaul as well. We've now got a cultist base in the middle here where uh, previously it was mostly infested with the Myloks and the like in this kind of swampy area. Basically, the gist of it is it's again focused around the Blue Ridge Caravan. So Luca Costa, the young nephew of the guy at Big Ben Tunnel East, is working for the caravan. He was setting up a deal with some people who turned out to be Mothman cultists and who promptly robbed him, nicked his Brahmin, nicked all his stuff, and hauled it off to their uh, hideout in the Cranberry Glade. So basically, Luca wants you to head in there give him what for, get his stuff back, and get back out before he gets into too much trouble with his uncle. So, a fairly decent little mission to run into the glade. We've got this really, really quite cool uh, Mothman sort of base in the middle of the glade, which is really quite nice. It's um, got the right vibe for a, a cultist base in the middle of the swamp. I really like the, the look of this area. I'm quite impressed with this one. So you head in, you take down a load of the cultists, grab a load of explosives, blow the doors off the buildings here so that you can get access to the Brahmin and also to the crates that have uh, the stolen goods in them. Load up the Brahmin and get out of there. At the end of the event, you are accosted by a new local, specifically a new cryptid, the Ogua, which basically looks like a spiky turtle thing, which is quite cool. It's fairly large, not too crazy big. It's... Um, it's not as big as the Sheep Squatch, and um, I should say as well, at the end of the previous event, Safe and Sound, you get to meet a cryptid there as well. So the one at the end of Beast of Burden is the Ogua, it's the turtle-like one. It's pretty cool, decent fight. And the one at the end of Safe and Sound is the Blue Devil, which seems to be some kind of connection between a werewolf and the Jersey Devil. Both of these are pretty cool. They're not quite as big as the Sheep Squatch, but they are bigger than something like, say, a Snallygaster. So 
fairly big size, but not crazy big. They probably sound to be a little bit tougher, I think, these guys. They're legendary as they are. And uh, yeah, fairly cool. Like the design on them, but they, they went down a little bit too quickly on the PTS. But yeah, as an end of event kind of mini boss, that's quite cool. Hopefully we're going to be running into those in other places as well. I get the vibe that we are, which is uh, cool. So they should pop up around the map as well. So adding a little bit of extra variety into uh, the cryptid selection available, which is really cool. So yeah, enjoyed this new event. It's got a lot of theme to it. It's nice to see the Blue Ridge Caravan getting a bit more use, even if some of the lore stuff surrounding these events is a bit iffy. But yeah, definitely very, very cool. So the other big changes that are coming with this update relate to the UI. So first up, I want to talk about something that I've noticed that I haven't seen anybody else talk about, and that is a change that I have been wanting since not terribly long after the game first came out, four plus years ago. And uh, I've been crying out for this, I was actually just talking about it on stream the other day, and we're finally getting it this summer. And that is to do with legendary weapons, or armor, or whatever, legendary items. When you pick them up, currently, you get that big pop-up in the middle of your screen, which is a revolving picture of the weapon with stuff all over the place, and it's huge, and it blocks your view, and if it's happening mid-fight, you are unable to see what you're aiming at. And it drives me absolutely bananas. No longer will this be the case as of June. They have done pretty much exactly what I wanted them to do. With a little bit of extra as well. Which is to say they have shrunk the picture down and they have moved it to the side of the screen. The whole UI element when you pick up one of those legendary items has been shrunk and moved out of the way. Which is exactly what I wanted from it. And it's also put where I wanted them to put it. So... Uh, I can't complain about that. <laughs> I'm really, really happy about this little change. Um, especially as somebody who doesn't use VATS and who sort of free aims, the, having that stuff come up in the middle of the screen, right where the crosshair was, was nightmarish. So really good to have that change. One of the cool things about it, though, that they have done, that I wasn't thinking of, is they've taken basically the UI element from Legendary Crafting, i.e. the pop-up that comes up when you roll new legendaries for a piece of gear, and they've added that into the equation as well. So while it pops up on the left in much smaller fashion, it also gives you more information about the legendary item you've picked up in more detail on the side. So it takes up less room, it's clearer, and it's just across the board a massive improvement. So yeah, I wanted to kind of sing the praises of this one because I've been asking for this for a very long time and they have not only delivered it at long last, they have delivered it plus some good stuff as well. So yeah, really happy about that. Okay, so we actually have a whole bunch of other UI changes and things as well that I want to talk about too. As we can see, if we go into the game settings menu, there are, in addition to everything that's normally there and all of the new settings that they have added under that tab recently, they are adding a whole load of new stuff. So um, first up, we've got a grenade stroke mine targeting mode, um, and that switches between all, only mine, and none. Now, I'm not quite sure what this does, but... Educated guess, uh, last year they changed it so you could target grenades and mines with vats and destroy them. Um, for example, a grenade could be coming through the air and get shot out the air. Now, my guess, and it is just a guess because I've not really been able to test this yet, is that basically this will allow you to either choose whether or not you can target everybody's grenades or only your own. Because on occasion, when you throw a grenade, targeting it so it blows up in the air, um, you can... can kind of control where it explodes a little better that can be situationally quite handy um, but if there's multiple grenades flying around that can screw it up because you need to lock onto it pretty quick so selecting only mine will make that a little bit easier you can have it on all if you want or you can set it onto none so you won't be able to target grenades at all I think I want to stress that little point because as I said I haven't had the occasion to test this that's my guess as to what this does we'll have to see as we go on so Show muzzle flash effects is the next one on the list, and it's muzzle flare. Exactly what you'd imagine it is. Um, for the most part, probably not a big deal to people. However, if you are somebody like me who doesn't really use VATS and likes to aim down sights, this is going to be quite handy as the muzzle flare can often make it really hard to see what you're aiming at. Once you start firing, especially if you're firing with an automatic weapon which continually has muzzle flare, you get basically a whiteout in front of your face that means you cannot see what you're aiming at, especially if you're trying to land headshots. If you turn off the muzzle flash effects, that effect is greatly reduced and it's much easier to see what you're aiming at while you shoot. A little bit less realistic, but practical. Very, very practical. And I do quite like that. So definitely going to be doing that one myself. So the next one kind of ties into me as well. 
show non-explosive weapon impact effects. So talking about explosive effects, my favoured weapon at the moment, my handmade, does have an explosive effect on it. That still happens even with the muzzle flash effects turned off. So you're still getting some effects that are making it hard to see what you're aiming at, but um, it is an improvement. Now for non-explosive weapon effects, you can turn these on and off, and it basically changes that impact effect. So we're going to have a look at it here with my uh, Ultrasight Gatling laser, and you can see when you're firing it with this effect on, you get smoke and little sort of flares around the point of impact. When you turn it off, that goes away and you just get the lines directly hitting the target, the laser lines. Um, which actually is kind of more realistic, probably, unless you assume you're setting something on fire, I suppose. But anyway, point is, it makes it much easier to see exactly where your bullets or laser beams or whatever it may be are impacting, which makes aiming a lot easier, particularly for those who don't use VATS. The drawback to this is it only affects non-explosive weapon impact effects. There is no setting in here for explosive effects, which is the one thing we really need at the moment. In particular, when you look at the Fat Man and the Nuka Launcher from the last season, those are two really big examples at the moment. You see people, particularly at events, spamming the living daylights out of those, and it makes it really hard to see what's going on. The noise is uh, infuriating, and you can often get your screen completely... Um, flashed out by the explosion. We really need something done about that so that we don't have to endure the drawbacks to other people's weapon choices, basically. And that all centers around explosive weapons. So this stuff only affects your own gear anyway. It doesn't affect what you see from other people's weapons, so far as I can tell. It seems like it's client side and therefore only affects the individual player who has turned on the settings, which would make sense. But we definitely need something that kind of extends out from this towards uh, not being basically bothered by other people's spamming of the fat man and the like. So that's a, just a side observation off from this. But for those who particularly like to aim down sights to fire their weaponry, certainly these are good additions. So the last one that I want to talk about is advanced mod descriptions. This is cool. If you are somebody who is really into deep diving into their min-maxing and their stats and things like this, it's fantastically useful because you get detailed breakdowns of how each item affects your weapon. So if you take it over to a weapons workbench and you've got advanced mod descriptions turned on, you get a lot more detail. Like This thing increases the armor penetration, it'll tell you by how much. If it um, slows down your reload speed, it tells you by what percentage. If it reduces recoil, the information's there on that, as well as everything else in damage. Basically, it gives you a lot more clear information as to exactly what effect the item you are changing will have on the weapon. So if you change that uh, receiver, you'll find out exactly how much more damage it will do, because it'll tell you right there on the screen. If you change the magazine type out, it'll tell you exactly what changes that will have in clear detail, both um, at the bottom and you know, on the left as well, and also in the sort of legendary box at the top as well. So there's information coming up all over the place, which is really great for min-maxers who are into that, because you can really get the nuance in. And for those who just want to see whether or not they've picked the right stuff and are not actually particularly bothered about the figures themselves, then in general you can see whether or not this thing is an improvement or not to the weapon that you are modifying. So even for those who are not min-maxers, It'll help you find the right choices more quickly because you can actually see what's happening. So yeah, uh, advanced mod descriptions are something I would probably recommend turning on when it arrives in June. Okay, so a couple of things I want to mention just before I wrap up here at the end, and that is uh, on the patch notes here. So I'll link these down below if you do want to check them out. Most of what we got here is basically what we've covered already. You can have a look if you would like. But uh, there's a couple of things on additional improvements that are worth a quick look. So first up is uh, expedition stuff that uh, I have not yet mentioned, and that is some changes to the way that basically functions. So top of the list, players no longer need to charge the Ultrasight battery to run an expedition. So that is the thing that was slowing us down. It's basically what was limiting us to one expedition per day. And um, as of June, you will basically be able to launch as many as you like as the team leader without having to do the daily quests. Kind of mixed feelings on that. Daily quests have been moved into more standard daily quest territory like all of the other ones in the game which is fine although i feel like it's kind of why would you do it now i'm at a bit of a loss maybe they're adding new rewards so we'll have to look into that but uh, it does seem to make them a little bit less worthwhile on the other hand along with uh, that change they've also increased the amount of stamps you can get from from ashes to fire and the number of legendary items as well so that's one of the two expeditions 
and the stamp cost of items from vendors, it says here, although that basically means Giuseppe, has been reduced. So we'll be able to get more stamps more quickly and therefore pick up the items in Giuseppe's inventory more quickly if you'd like to. I am hoping that this is implying that we've got more expeditions, rewards and hopefully content, fingers crossed, coming on down the line because the original setup was designed to kind of, or it felt like it was designed to spread out how long it takes you to get the rewards. And I know for me, I've got everything that I really want, not everything on the list, but everything that I really want. So I definitely would be happy to have a new set of rewards available. But um, yeah, if we can get through it faster, it means less incentive to keep playing it over a longer time. It means there's a need to put out new rewards quicker. So maybe they're finding out they can do that. Who knows? But uh, fingers crossed this is um, a good thing on that front. But either way, more expeditions you can run when you want without having to... Um, have the arbitrary limitations that were there before, which is pretty cool, really. So we've got a whole load of stuff on the UI changes here, which is pretty cool. There's a couple of uh, balance changes, which are not massively significant. Um, and a couple of bug fixes as well. The big one I wanted to point out here was uh, a known issue thing here at the bottom. And that is, uh, as others have pointed out, daily ops and expeditions contextual ammo drops have been massively decreased on the PTS. Uh, so in this case, it says you can only pick up uh, batches of four shots for whatever weapon you're getting. So in Daily Ops, in Expeditions, and uh, to a lesser degree in the rest of the game as well, when you shoot something with a handmade rifle to pick something out there, you will get 5.56 five, back because that is the ammo you are using. Basically, in Daily Ops and Expeditions, that was not dropping in the way it should be doing. This is a bug. Those who know about it, they expect to have this fixed uh, for a future version of the PTS, let alone before the update goes live. So... Uh, Basically, don't worry too much about that one. It's a temporary issue. It should be fine by the time the update goes live in June. So, there we go. That's stuff I pulled out of the PTS so far after a really not particularly long amount of time playing around with it. I suspect there's going to be a whole load of other stuff going into this too that is going to be uh, pretty cool. And I'm looking forward to diving in and seeing what's what in subsequent versions of the PTS and stuff. As it currently stands, this update is slated for early June. Very, very standard. That's usually about when we have an update. Exactly when and where. We will find out nearer the time. Keep an eye out. I will, of course, let you know when I know. Regarding the current season, as per usual, that will likely change over with this update as well, which, again, is scheduled for early June. So you've probably got until early June to get through the current scoreboard before the next one comes around. Again, Bethesda haven't given us an exact date, so I will let you know when we know. But until then, early June is likely to be the threshold. So there we go. Hope you folks found this useful and informative. It's uh, really cool to look at some of the new stuff. Still wishing we were getting a roadmap and, you know, more story-based content, but for now, what is coming is good, if not quite as expansive as we would like. I have my theories as to why, and feel free to dive into the streams and ask me why if you want, but for now, I'm not going to repeat myself on that front. So, as I say, if you did enjoy this video, please consider dropping subs and likes. I very, very much appreciate it. Check out down below the video as well. We've got social media links, merch store. We've got the blue join button for channel memberships as well, if you're interested in supporting the channel that way whole load of buttons down there you can hit that will massively massively help out and i really 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 appreciate it so massive thank you to everyone who's done that and as i said join us for live streams to get the chance we are of course playing 76 looking forward to jumping back into that one and we are progressing through resident evil 4 and soon to be redfall as well so uh, lots of cool things happening on the streaming front as well so do join us for those if you get a chance but for now thank you very much for watching i look forward to speaking to you all very very soon